good day to you, my dear students. Uh, once again, I'm Sean Xavier Alcalita, uh, your instructor in uh, Philo 101, which is uh, Moral Philosophy or Ethics. So this time, I'll be talking about the next topic, which is about values or universal values. So why is it universal and why... Why is it that values is included in our topic manner? Okay, so let's proceed. So, we term value is a quality that wins people, things, events, or situations. No, so it designates a moral character or moral characteristics to each and every individual based on his habits, no? like piety, responsibility, justice, love, and etc. Next one is universal. It refers to a concept that refers to the to each and every member of the class. So, a set of all things created. What is common to all its kind, no? Okay, so universal values are formed by implied behavioral standards that are necessary to live a harmonious and peaceful society. And it is a notion that is not obvious to define because a value is associated with morality and ethics. It is always associated with morality and ethics. Moreover, uh, it is Moral values are acquired with family, education, school, because the process of socialization involves a new generation's internalized timeless concepts. Okay. So, let's start with a philosopher in the name of Max Scheller. So, values for Scheller are particular class of ideal objects, intentional objects, a man's feelings. So, the mind of every person is blind to a value. So, because a value is a metaphysical concept. When I say metaphysics, it goes, uh, it goes beyond our five senses. No, it cannot be seen. Uh, it is not, it is not a material thing. But a value is invisible to the eye. So, uh, only the heart, that man, can recognize the value. Okay? Okay, so another thing here. That educators would say that values are caught and not taught. So, man knows values through the heart because only man can feel it. Strictly speaking, man can think of values, but what man is thinking of is a concept of value. So, man sees, by, uh, sees blind all empirical multiplicity and complexity of values because the basic structure of his heart which is more deserving of being called the center of man as a spiritual being. So, it is the heart that sees all the values, no? And we cannot see, we cannot see the values through our, through our own senses, that's according to him. But it is the heart. Why? Because the human heart is the seat of the Ordo Amoris. The, for Max Scheller, the, the, the humanity is uh, basically it is based on our human heart. Why? It's because of the Ordo Amoris. So, which is the microcosm of the whole objective world of values. Mm. Okay. And moreover, Max Scheller also claimed that a value has something to do with worth. And all human beings, according to Max Scheller, 
are the bearers of our own value. So what does it mean that human beings, man or human beings, are the bearers of value? It's because all of us have our own values. For example, um, if you're a millionaire, you're also, that is your value. Um, another thing, anything that you have, or if you're a millionaire, or if you win the Miss Universe, that is also your value. <laughs> uh, your prestige also determines your value, even your power. No, So, all of us are the bearers of our own value. And our value can increase or decrease. Okay, so what are the next one are the hierarchy of value. So there are levels of value. Okay. Okay, so what are the hierarchy of values according to Scheller? Number one is the sensory values. Sensory values are those values that are objects of sensory feelings and they're corresponding to subjective states of delight and pain. So anything that you agree or disagree, something that gives you comfort or something that gives you pain. So that is a sensory value. So you value some, normally we value something that is more pleasant rather than that gives you pain. But anything that is painful to you, something that you do not want to, uh, that you do not want to adapt. So, because we are, uh, by nature, uh, man, by nature, wants more pleasure than pain. Yeah. So, these are the sensory values. Uh, for example, uh, ayo kung mag Gusto ko maging milyonaryo. Okay, so you want to become a millionaire. Pero ayaw ko magtrabaho. <laughs> Paano ka maging milyonaryo kung ayaw? <laughs> well, of course, that's one of the uh, common sayings people are talking with no? today. The next one is what we call it vital values. Values of the noble and the vulgar. So, feeling states of this modality include all the modes of feeling of life like health, sickness, aging, exhaustion, energy, vigor, and others. So, vital values, it's something to do with well-being. No? Um, you, we value our health. So, I want to eat right. I want to exercise, eat a balanced diet. These are all the vital value. So I value my body. I value myself. So I have to be, I have to be healthy. Uh, I want to live a healthy lifestyle in order to avoid, uh, to avoid sickness. No, so that is a vital value. The next one is what we call it a spiritual values. No, so. Values correspond to spiritual feelings more appropriately to the spiritual act of love. So the realm of spiritual value is this thing from the uh, this thing from the vital value. Now, in the kind of givenness, uh, spiritual values have peculiar detachment. So what I mean, detachment na, and independence from the sphere of the lived body, unlike vital values and sensory values so there is still an dependence no so feelings of health i i do not want to get sick but i want to eat a healthy lifestyle so there is still a connection close connection with pleasure or pain no as well as our uh the uh inter uh dependence from the sphere of the lived body but this one spiritual values it's already have a peculiar detachment and independence from the lived body and our environment okay so what are the 
spiritual values, no? Okay. So, values of the beautiful and the ugly. We're talking here about the realm of aesthetic values. Anything that is beautiful, anything that is ugly are also considered as a spiritual value. Mm. So, ang kagandahan ay nasa loob. In Filipino, Filipino concept of value, no? Uh, ang, ang kagandahan ng isang tao ay nasa loob, kalooban. Hindi sa nakikita, but nasa kalooban ng isang tao. Next one, are those values that are just or unjust? Those values that are righteous or not? So, I can say, guys, our class, that um, values of justice and injustice are those values that, these are what we call it the moral values, no? Vi values that will give you uh, righteousness, uh, values that are uh, values that give us righteousness, like love, like that. These are the typical values under spiritual values. Next, values of pure cognition of truth, like knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge and wisdom are also spiritual values. That is why, according to Plato, that knowledge is a virtue. And since that knowledge and wisdom are also considered virtues, therefore, for Scheller, it is considered as a spiritual values under the values of pure cognition or truth. No? So anything that you have learned in, your, in the school is also valuable. That is why you paid for it. And anything that you paid for in the school would even cost you a lifetime when you will become a professional someday. So that is why it is also valuable. So uh, there are reactions belonging in this realm, such as pleasing, approving, respect, retributive connection, spiritual sympathy, which is the foundation of friendship. Okay, the last one, uh, the highest of all values are those values of the holy and unholy. So, these are the higher than spiritual values and the vital one higher than the sensory values. No? So, when we say values of the holy and unholy, these are the values that are pertaining to our religion, particularly pertaining to God. So that is why uh, uh, our respect towards the divine, our respect towards God should be given the highest value and should be given the highest honor above of all things. Uh, that is why these values are totally independent of things and powers, persons held to be holy at different times. Under these values, are those things of value in sacraments, cults, and other forms of worship? Okay? Okay, next one is Shalom H. Schwartz. Um, concept of universal values. So, his universal values or concept of universal values is based on his uh, research done in 44 countries in 25,000 people. No? And moreover, according to him, that values as conceptions of the desirable that influence the people the way people select action and evaluate events, no? So, that is based on the, as I, as I have said a while ago, 
uh, that he made a research no uh, uh, in 44 countries and 25,000 people with a wide range of different cultural types no suggests that there are 56 specific universal values but of the 56 uh, he uh, of all the 56 universal values that are being answered by those people that he interviewed during his research there are top 10 no top 10 universal values based from his research from 44 countries in 25,000 people okay so these are the 10 top 10 universal values as what Schwartz have found out in his research number one is universalism number two is benevolence number three is tradition number four is conformity number five security uh, six power seven achievement eight hedonism and nine stimulation and number 10 lastly is the self-direction so when you say universalism it is the understanding appreciation tolerance and protection for the welfare of all people and for nature benevolence on the other hand uh, is a preservation and enhancement of the welfare of people with whom one is in frequent personal contact but in Chinese philosophy uh, especially uh, Confucius benevolence has been referred to as human heartedness in Filipino concept that is what we call it as makatao no? number three is tradition so when you say tradition from the word tradere which means to pass to pass on no so tradition means a respect commitment and acceptance of the customs and ideas that traditional culture or religion provide the self Okay, next one is the conformity. So, restraint of actions, inclinations, and impulses likely to, to upset or harm others and violate social expectations or norms. So, conformity could also be described as obedience. It's also part of that. Next is security. So, you know already what security is. So it is a value. We value our security. We value our safety. We value harmony. Uh, stable of society. We want a stable, uh, stable society, free from corruption, F uh, stable of relationships, and especially our, our own selves. <laughs> Next one is the power. We're talking about here the social status and prestige, or even control. Or dominance so control or dominance in other words that you can have the uh, the skill of influencing over people and also resources the next way the next one is the achievement talking here about the personal success through demonstrating competence according to social standards hedonism uh, hedonism means a pleasure so anything that is pleasurable to you that is a valuable thing next one is stimulation so excitement novelty and even challenges in life you you dive all the difficulties in life that is stimulation and lastly self-direction so independent thought and action choosing creating and even exploring Okay. Okay, so first we discussed with uh, Max Scheller's view on values on next one in Shalom Swartz. And the next one will be from the United Nations, no? the UN Charter on Universal Values. So, what are the values enshrined in UN Charter? So, respect for fundamental human rights, 
social justice and human dignity and respect for the equal right of men and women. And then on, in a speech in Turbingen University in Germany, uh, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan emphasized that progress, equal rights, and human dignity are acutely needed in this age of globalization. However, three years ago in a millennium millennium declaration he said he said that all states reaffirmed certain fundamental values um, as being essential to international relations in the 21st century what are the values of so freedom equality solidarity tolerance respect for nature and shared responsibility so they adopted the practical achievable targets which is the MDG, or what we call it as the Millennium Development Goals for relieving a blight of extreme poverty, making such rights as education, basic health care, clean water, reality for all, and etc. So what are the uh, basic human values okay what are the basic universal human values so number one is happiness so in the ancient past the founders of the big religions in the world have already taught about the reward for a religious life an afterlife in the paradise, heaven, or nirvana, etc. So to enjoy, there is an ultimate and eternal happiness. And from this, we can understand that in fact, eternal happiness is an ultimate value for all, of all religious people. The next one is peace. So, peace has to be seen as a basic condition for freedom and happiness. For without peace, there cannot be a real freedom. You know? So, wherever there is fight, threat, or hostility, our freedom and happiness are inhibited or totally prevented. The next one is love. Love, in a general sense, can be best defined as feelings or an experience of deep connectedness or oneness with any other human being, any animal, plant, tree, thing, or animable. Love can also be experienced as something far beyond any comprehension and totally indescribable. That is why, according to philosopher Blaise Pascal, who is also a mathematician, who invented a, uh, a calculator, he said that, that the heart has a reasons in which the reason your human mind doesn't know. Mm, char. <laughs> okay, so let me continue. Love may happen to us when we are able to be open to the beauty and nature of other people or to the beauty and mystery of nature in general, or even the beautiful things. Hence, the importance of human-friendly mentality, which contains an attitude of openness to the basically loving nature of others. And the state of openness out of human-friendliness imply an openness and friendly attitude to the whole of existence. Next one is freedom, which means an experience of unrestricted and to be as much as possible independent of the social pleasure or pressure, as I've said, pressure of others. A basic condition for happiness is, however, the experience of an inner and mental freedom. Freedom from all kinds of stress, worry, anxiety, problems, obligations, and fears often directly or indirectly caused by respectless, egocentric, and power-oriented mentality 
for many others in the society. So that is why, guys, um, inner freedom is more important than outer freedom. So uh, our inner freedom can be changed by our own will, by our own selves, but the outer freedom can be difficult to change. Mm. Next, safety. So safety means free of threat, fear, and survival stress. Without safety people tend to live out of their individual survival instinct and long-term insecurity creates an egocentric survival mentality have you watched the movie the purge <laughs> when the government declared the purge everyone was in chaos and everyone fought or everyone every people fight uh, fight for their safety so that's it. Mm. Next is intelligence. Has been defined in many ways to include a capacity for logic, understanding, self-awareness, learning, emotional knowledge, reasoning, planning, creativity, and even problem solving. It can be more generally described as the ability to perceive or infer information and to retain it as knowledge to be applied towards adaptive behaviors within an environment or context. The next one is respect mm. or human respect. So, the most basic principle of any social community is feelings of connectedness which come out from our perception, empathy, and awareness that the other human is basically as we are ourselves. So, in this respect, uh, the value of respect, it creates trust and a friendly attitude towards the other. Out of this empathy and the awareness that the others basically as we are ourselves and the resulting feelings of connectedness we feel we feel a natural and spontaneous respect for the other next is equality so originates from the word equalis or aquius or aqua, uh, aquila Aquilitas, no. So equality means equal, no. Uh, in French or in Latin words, which means level, no. Kalevelang. So equality used in political science correspond to the meaning which, from which originates, no. So every person has certain claims to equality. There are two very important forms of legal and formal equality. One is equality before the law and equality protection of law. What is to be noted here is that the legality, the legal member of the legal association can legitimately claim that all citizens must be treated equally by law and no discrimination is to be allowed. So everyone is equal, no? before the law and since that everyone is equal the, uh, the government should see to it that everyone is treated equally every individual has the right to claim equal liberties with others when the state authority can ensure this it will be assumed that justice will no longer be far away Number nine is a connection to number eight, which is justice. According to Aristotle, the justice is a virtue. It is a virtue on giving what is due to others. And here, it is a proper administration of the law, the fair and equitable treatment of all individuals under the law. So, general justice is needed 
to realize and maintain our highest human values of freedom, peace, life, love, and happiness. And injustice can prevent or inhibit these highest human values. So that is justice. That is why uh, for Aristotle, there are two types of justice in his Nicomachean Ethics. First one is what we call it as commutative justice. So when you say commutative justice, that is a fair exchange. It's a justice based on a fair exchange. That is equality, kumbaga. Uh, for example, I buy, I want to buy a 120 grams of um, ano ba to? Uh, junk food named uh, Chippy worth, uh, for example, 100 grams that is worth uh, 25 pesos. So, I pay for 25 pesos in exchange, I receive the chippy. Okay? So, that is fair exchange. That is equality. That is commutative justice. But when we say distributive justice, that's a second second uh, definition or second type. It is a justice based on giving what is due for a single person. Mm -hmm. So, Whatever the president receives his salary, for example, President Duterte, the president of the Republic of the Philippines, receives 399,000 pesos per month over a, uh, shall I say, a sales lady working in a department store who receives only uh, 12,000 pesos monthly. When some people say, ah, it's unfair kasi mataas ang sweldo ni President Duterte or the President of the Philippines over the over the sales lady is also only receiving at a minimum rate. But justice demands that since that he's the President of the Philippines, so he should be paid much rather than rather than rather than on the, someone who is working in a department store. Mm. Because his life, his uh, job is more difficult than working in a department store. So that is why he should be competing so much. Mm. Next is nature. Understanding our physical dependence of nature and our awareness of being part of it are needed to see the basic virtue of nature. So man is part of nature and our very basic human existence is dependent of nature and its ecology. Okay. Lastly, of course, is health. So, World Health Organization defined health as being a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely as the absence of disease or infirmity. So, health is a resource for everyday life, not the objective of living. Health is the positive concept of emphasizing social and personal resources. Okay. So, the next one is human dignity. So, when we say human dignity, it's from the Latin word dignitas, which means worthiness. So, Dignity implies that each person is worthy of honor, respect for who they are, not just for what they can do. In other words, human dignity cannot be earned and cannot be taken away. That is why human dignity is inalienable. It cannot be transferred to another. It is, uh, it is already inherent in us since birth. And God, 
himself is the creator of since that God created us in our image and likeness all of us uh, all of us especially especially our lives human lives are sacred because human person is the most central and the clearest reflect of God reflection of God among us So, human beings have transcendent worth and value that comes from God. So, this dignity is not based on any human quality, legal mandate, or individual merit or accomplishment. Okay, so the next lesson is talking now about the moral character. So the development of moral character. So the philosopher who discussed this one in his writings was Aristotle. That he tells us that there are good people in the world. So they, these are the ones who exhibit excellences. So what we call it the excellence of character or ethikai aretai. So from the on the word arete which means an excellence no? so we translate it as a moral virtue or moral excellence so when we speak of moral virtue or an excellence of character the emphasis is on the combination of qualities that make an individual a sort of ethically admirable person that he is no? so these are the qualities that makes a person an ab admirable uh, admirable no qualities like uh, virtues this is what we call it as a virtue so uh, virtue is being defined as a habit of doing good and avoid vice okay so in his book to in Nicomachean ethics that is what we call it the excellence of character ethikai aretai so it is a state concerned with choice lying a mean relative to us so it, it goes it follows the mean between the two extremes so what is virtuous is something to do that lies between the mean and avoid the extremes of defect and excess so katamtaman lang dili po makulangan dili po siya sobraan so anything that is virtuous is something to do at the taking things at a balance and in the way in which the man uh, practical wisdom would also determine so it is through our wisdom would determine if we follow what is right in a certain circumstances Okay, so what is a moral character? So, it is an evaluation of individuals' stable moral qualities. The concept of character can imply a variety of attributes, including the existence or lack of virtues such as empathy, courage, fortitude, honesty, and loyalty, or of good behaviors or habits. Moral character primarily refers to the assemblage of qualities that distinguish one individual from another. So, Lawrence Pervin defines moral character as a disposition to express behavior in consistent patterns of functions across a range of situations. So, the importance of having a character. So, number one is to achieve 
peace of mind. So, people with character sleep well at night. They take great pride in knowing that their intentions and actions are honorable. So, people with character also stay true to their beliefs, do right by others, and always take the high ground. So, that's number one. The second one is uh, strengthen trust. So, people with character enjoy meaningful relationships based on openness, honesty, and mutual respect. When you have good moral character, people know that your behavior is uh, reliable and your heart is in the right place and your word is good as gold. So, palabra di honor. Of course, it can also build a solid, good reputation. So, that is something that we should take care of. No? Imuhang pangalan, your name. So, people with character command a rock-solid reputation. This helps them attract exciting opportunities like a magnet. Number four, reduce anxiety. People with character carry less baggage. No? They're comfortable within their own skin and they accept responsibility for their actions. They never have to play games, waste precious time, keeping their stories straight, and invent excuses to cover their behind. The next one is increase leadership effectiveness. Leaders with character are highly effective. They have no need to pull, rank, or resort to command and control to get results. Instead, they are effective because they are knowledgeable, admired, trusted, and respected. Respected, no? So, this helps them secure buy-in automatically without requiring egregious rules and strong oversight designed to force compliance. Of course, it builds confidence. People with character don't worry about embarrassment if their actions are publicly disclosed. This alleviates the need for damage control or the fear of potential disgrace as a result of the indiscretions. Moreover, you'll become a positive role model. <laughs> So, people with character set the standard for excellence. They live their life as an open book, teaching others important life lessons through their words and their deeds. Number eight, so they will live a purpose-driven life. People with character live a life that they can be proud of. They're driven to make a difference to do right by others rather than trying to impress others with extravagance. And lastly, if you are in the business sector, a, a businessman with good character can also build a strong business. Doing the right thing is a good business. Everything else being equal, talented people would rather work for and customers would rather buy from. So, companies that do right by their people, customers, and communities. While unprinciplied business tactics, so business tactics that have no principles, doesn't have any, or the, in business tactics that do not have a core values, mm -hmm, may provide short-term results. And moreover, it is not a long-term strategy at all. That is why uh, character matters. So, how to develop a moral character? So, that will be the next slide. So, the development of moral character will start with to defining your core values. 
That is why that is your assignment that I give you. What is your family core values in my family? Because the core values of your family would define the characteristics that you have as a whole family. Uh, so, know what is most important to you by determining your values for your professional and personal life. These are the principles that are foundation of your priorities, choices, actions, and behaviors. The next one is habits. Practice the habits. Habits is uh, something that is a repetition, an action, repetitive action. No, Something that you do every day. Something that you do all the time. No, So pick or one or two of the traits of good character to practice for several weeks. Write down the actions you want to take or the behaviors you define that reflect this trait and implement them into your daily life and interaction. So when a rubber band on your wrist, create reminders to help you practice. The third one is to find the people with a character. Surround yourself with people who reflect the character traits you want to embrace. They will inspire and motivate you to build these traits in yourself. Try to avoid people who have a weak character and make bad decisions. So, surround yourself with those. If you're surrounding with people who are, who are mahilig sa bisyo, of course, you'll tend to follow what they do. But if you surround with people who are very successful, of course, you will also become a successful person because a character of one person can also be, it's like a virus, no? Uh, mat, uh, nakakahawa yan, no? So if you are, kung nakahawa ka sa character na good character, it could also be part, it could, you could also be uh, part from that, no? But if you're also uh, surrounded with people with many vices, you could also follow what they do. Okay. Number four is to take some risks. So start taking small actions toward a goal or value that involves some level of risk. When you face the possibility of failure and challenge yourself towards success, so you become mentally and emotionally stronger and more committed to your principles. So, that's why uh, one saint said, uh, Saint Louis de Montfort, if you don't take risks for God, uh, you won't do anything great for Him. Next one is stretch yourself. Create high standards and big goals for yourself. So expect the best of yourself and constantly work toward that even though you will have setbacks and occasional failures. So every stretch builds your confidence and knowledge that your character is getting stronger. The next one is commit to self-improvement. So realize that building your character is a lifelong endeavor. It is something that is practiced both in minute and the defining moments of your life. There will be times that you step up to the character, um, to the character traits that you embrace. So there are times that you also fail. So by remaining committed to personal growth and learning about yourself, your character will naturally improve even though the failure. So that is why uh, sometimes we uh, we learn things also uh, there are other things that we also learn from our failures. Mm. That is one of the keys uh, key to success of some successful people that these people are do not afraid to take the risks of uh, having failures to come into them. No? So the next one.
So, some good character traits to practice. Number one, attract the trust and respect of other people. It allows you to influence others. Uh, it changes your perspective about failure. That is why, as I've said, that sometimes failure could also lead us to success. Um, it sustains you through your difficult times or opposition. It improves your self-esteem, self-respect, and confidence. Number six, it creates a happy, uh, it's a foundation for a happy and healthy relationship. Number seven, helps you stay committed to your values and goals. And lastly, it improves your chance of success in work and other endeavors. Okay, so the next one are the character traits that impact one's happiness. And number one is integrity. So it's by having strong moral principles and core values and then conducting your life with those as your guide. So person with strong integrity are those people who are whose moral principles and core values are the guiding points in their own lives. The next one is honesty. It's more than telling the truth. And it's living with the truth. It is being straightforward and trustworthy in all your interactions, relationships, and thoughts. Being honest requires self-honesty and authenticity. So, pagiging makatotoo. Next is loyalty. So, it is faithfulness and devotion to your loved ones, your friends, and anyone with whom you have trusted relationship. So, loyalty can also extend to your employer, uh, organizations that you belong to, your community, and even your country. The next is respectfulness. So, you treat yourself and others with courtesy, kindness, deference, dignity, and civility. You offer basic respect as a sign of your value for the worth of all people and your ability to accept the inherent flaws we all possess. Next is responsibility. You accept personal, relational, career, community, and social or societal obligations even when they are difficult or uncomfortable. So you follow through on commitments and proactively create or accept accountability for your behavior and choices. So, responsibility means to accept accountability for our own actions. Next one is humility. So, mapayobsanon in Bisaya, but actually, it is not, uh, some others would say, nga, guapa lagi kaday. Ngayon ko, dili, oy. Guapa lagi ka. Jode, ay. Ansato, ansato. Mm. So, humility or profound humility is that you have a confident and yet a modest op opinion of your own self-importance. So, you don't see yourself as too good for other people or situations. So, you have a learning and growth mindset and a desire to express and, e and experience gratitude for what you have rather than expecting you deserve more. The next one is compassion. Hmm. You have a deep sympathy and pity for the suffering and misfortune of others. You have a desire to do something to alleviate their suffering. Next is fairness. Using discernment, compassion, and integrity you strive to make decisions and take actions based on what you consider the ultimate best course or outcome for all involved. Next is forgiveness. Mapasailoon. You make conscious and intentional decisions to let go of the resentment and anger towards someone for an offense. Hmm. Whether or not forgiveness is sought by the offender. So, 
those people who who offended someone are the only those people who uh, can take the first move to ask for forgiveness. So forgiveness may or may not include pardoning, restoration, or reconciliation. It extends both to others and to oneself. Next is authenticity. Oh, pagka makatotoo. So you're able to be your real and true self. Be true to yourself without pretension, posturing, or insincerity. So you are capable of showing appropriate vulnerability and self-awareness. Next is courage. Mm. So according to Aristotle, courage is a virtue when uh, it's a virtue of how or to avoid dangerous and difficult situations. When to face or when to avoid dangerous situations. But here, on the other hand, it also implies that in spite of fear of danger, discomfort, or pain, you have the mental fortitude. So that is why the word here is fortitude. To carry on with a commitment, plan, or decision, knowing it is the right or the best course of action. Mm. Next is generosity. You're willing to offer your time, energy, efforts, emotions, words, or assets without the expect expectation of something in return. You offer this freely and often joyously. So, uh, giving yourself time or even you're giving a small amount of money to something to someone those in need that is also generosity so mapagbigay next is perseverance muli na hutay in bisaya no it's a steadfast persistence and determination to continue on with the course of action belief or purpose even if it is difficult or uncomfortable in order to reach a higher goal or outcome. Next one is by being polite. Politeness. You are knowledgeable of basic good manners, common courtesies and etiquette, and are willing to apply those all people you encounter. So you desire to learn the skills of politeness in order to enhance your relationships and self-esteem next one is kindness it is an attitude of being considerate helpful and benevolent to others it is motivated by a positive disposition and the desire for warm and pleasant interactions Next one is lovingness. So, it is the ability to be loving toward those you love means showing them through your words, actions, and expressions how deeply you care about them. It includes the willingness to be open and vulnerable. So, the next one, 17, is optimism. So, it is a sense of hopefulness and confidence about the future. So, optimism, in other words, means hope. It involves a positive mental attitude in which you interpret life events, people, and situations in a promising light. Reliability. You can be consistently dependent upon to follow through on your commitments, actions, and decisions. You do what you say you will do. Mm. That's reliability. The next one is conscientiousness. So you have the desire to do things well or to the best of your ability. You are thorough, 
careful, efficient, organized, and vigilant in your efforts based on your own principles or sense of what is right. The last one is self-discipline. So you are able through good habits or willpower to overcome your desires or feelings in order to follow the best course of action or to rise to your commitments or principles. So you have the strong sense of self-control in order to reach the desired goal. So the best example of the model of self-discipline is Kobe Bryant. So if you remember Kobe Bryant, this principle, the mamba or uh, mamba mentality, that means that you're going to, uh, self-discipline means that you're going to, uh, as much as possible, to overcome all your weaknesses and to strive for excellence. No? So that is a good habit or willpower to overcome difficulties in life. So to be the best in what you are. So that is the mamba mentality. That is also under self-discipline. Okay, so our next one here will be the stages of moral development. So the main proponent of the stage of moral development is Lawrence Kohlberg. Mm. Uh, Lawrence Kohlberg, the stages of moral development, a comprehensive stage, a moral theory based on John Piaget's theory of moral judgment. So this is John Piaget. And moreover, to those who are studying education and also those who are studying psychology, that John Piaget is the main proponent of the theory of cognitive development. But in Lawrence Kohlberg is more on the stages of moral development in the, in the persons, no? developed by Kohlberg in 1958. So, Jean Piaget also developed the theory called the Theory of Moral Judgment for Children and developed by Kohlberg in 1958. So, cognitive in nature, Kohlberg's theory focuses on the thinking process no? and that occurs when one decides whether a behavior is right or wrong. Okay, so there are other criticisms against the moral theory or the moral development of uh, Lawrence Kohlberg. And one of the persons or one of those people who contradicted this claim was his research assistant in the name of Carol Gilligan mm. who consequently developed her own ideas of moral development in, he, in her book The Different Voice no? Psychological Theory and Women's Development so she reacted it's because Kohlberg, Kohlberg's theory or, or stages of moral development that felt that more males than females moved past four in the moral development. So, moreover, he criticized a former mentor's theory because it was based on the upper class white men or boys in, he, in his research. And she argued that women are not deficient in their moral reasoning. So, she proposed that males and females reason different, differently. So what are the levels and the stages of moral development? Okay, so there are three levels 
and each level has two stages. So, level one is pre-conventional morality that is usually on the toddlers and even small kids, no? The stage one is the obedience and punishment. It is a behavior driven by avoiding punishment. So, um, so I don't like to do bad things because I do not want to get jailed. So I don't want to steal because I want uh, I I don't want to go to jail. So that is stage one. But on stage two is based on the individual interest. Moreover, self interest, no. So, I want to do good things because I want to be rewarded. For example, um, there's a lost and found section. Uh, there's a, I found a, I found a, a lost uh, 500,000 pesos inside the bag. And I want to return this because I want to, I want to receive a good reward. Uh, that is stage two. Mm, that's level one. Level two is a conventional morality. <clears throat> okay. So when you say conventional, so you follow the the norms of the society. So in stage three is interpersonal. It's what we call it nice boy or nice girl stage or good boy or good girl stage. What does it mean here? Okay. So Kung ano ang oso, sasabay ka. So, if your favorite actor or actress, nag uh, favorite actor, lalaki, if you do earrings, uh, sunod ka na yun, earrings. Oh, kung ang haircut niya is may pahak diri, oh, pahak, sad ka. So, that is stage 3. Hmm. That is nice boy, nice girl, or being cool girl, or cool boy, in this stage, no. But in stage four, it is based on the law and order orientation stage, no. So you tend to your behavior is driven by obeying the laws, obeying the authority. You obey the you obey the rules and regulations of the school. So I give you an example here. There you are. You want to cross the street. Mm. You want to cross the street. And then uh, there's uh, across the street there is a signage there. Um, no jaywalking. Mm. Okay. No jaywalking. Now, you want to cross the street and you observe. Walang CCTO or traffic law enforcer to catch the tuan, violators, no law violators, road rules. Mm. Now, Walang law, uh, traffic law enforcers. Okay. And then, bisan pa, even though it is stop, kahit pag stop, and then, some people would cross the street, kahit pa stop, and then, sasabay ka. Which stage is that? Stage 3 or stage 4? sasabay ka. That is stage 3. Because nisabay man ka, you sasabay ka, you you follow the the bandwagon to those people who are violating the road rules. But on stage 4, kahit pag stop na, kahit pag stop na, or, or shall I say, kahit stop pa ang signal kahit uh, tumatabok na ang mga tao of course you have to follow the traffic sign that you had to stop 
kahit ang iba dyan tumatabok na. It is because that your drive, your behavior is driven by the following the road uh, road rules and regulations. So that is stage 4. Okay, stage 5. On the other hand, stage 5 is based on a social contract orientation. So the, be the behavior is driven by the balance of social order and individual rights. So here, individual rights determine behavior. So the individual views, laws, and rules are as flexible tools for improving human purposes that is given the right situation now that is given the right situation there are exceptions to rules when laws are not consistent with individual rights and the interests of the majority it does not bring about good for people and alternatives should be considered I give you example here in the Bible no. Uh, you remember here in the Bible um, one of the rules or one of the laws of Moses here in the Bible is that um, um, healing on the Sabbath day uh, healing bawal no? bawal so it is not good to cure the sick during the Sabbath day. That's one of the rules. Now, here comes Jesus Christ reacting to this rule. So, he reacted, it somewhat sounds like this, that anin pa ang damo kung patay ng kabayo. Maghihintay ka pa ba ng susunod na araw uh, para gamutin yung sakit Kung may sakit, paano kung ang sakit niya malubha na? Will you wait for the next day? To will you wait for Monday para siya ma marapatan ng lunas? Bakit ngayon mismo bigyan mo ng lunas dahil malubha ng sakit niya? Di ba? Will you lift a small finger just to help this dying person? Why wait for the next day? when you can do it today. Diba? There are exceptions to rules. That's what you mean here, stage 5. Mm. Now, lastly, stage 6. That is why in stage 5, um, for that's according to before I proceed to stage 6, that's according to Friedrich Nietzsche, that there should be a transvaluation of values, that our values should be uh, should be transvalued. In what, what does it mean, transvaluation of values? That what is good for today may not be good for tomorrow. Hmm. Kung marapatan ng lunas, so that law, uh, when law does, uh, destroys the 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 life of man take away that law life is more important than the law itself that's transvaluation of values and lastly stage 6 so universal ethics is a behavior driven by internal moral principles no? so according to Kohlberg this is the highest stage of functioning. However, he claimed that some individuals will never match or will never reach, no, not match, <laughs> reach this level. There are some others na makarating sa stage 6. Christ, I've already reached this. Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. when she helped, the, when she feed, she fed the uh, thousands of dying people like that. Mm. At this stage, the appropriate action is determined by one's self-chosen ethical principles of 
conscience. These principles are abstract and universal in application. So this type of reasoning involves taking the perspective of every person or group that could potentially be affected by the decision. So the next slide will give you an in-depth details. There uh, two last two slides give you in-depth details of the stages of moral development. So I'll provide you with a video for your uh, for your viewing. So take a look. Lawrence Kohlberg's theory claims that our development of moral reasoning happens in six stages. The stages themselves are structured in three levels, pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. To understand this better, imagine a conflict at school. There is a fight in the schoolyard. Two ninth graders are beating up Tom. Those who watch the fight are at different stages of moral development, Let's see what they do and how they justify their behavior. At stage one, we make moral judgments based on obedience and punishment. Finn's sense of good or bad is directly linked to whether he gets punished or not. Finn sees what is happening to his friend and wants to help, but he doesn't because he is afraid the teacher may punish him if he gets caught fighting. He asks himself, how can I avoid punishment? At stage two, we are motivated by self-interest. Mary decides to intervene and help Tom. She knows that she might get punished, but she also knows that she could become a victim herself someday. If she helps Tom now, he might help her in the future. She is asking herself, what's in it for me? At stage three, interpersonal accord and conformity guide our moral judgment. Betty sees the fight and wants to intervene. But when she realizes that all the others are just watching, she decides not to get involved. She wants others to see that she is a good girl who is conforming with the ethics of the community. She asks herself, what do others think of me? At stage four, we value authority and want to maintain social order. When the teacher sees the group fighting, he immediately steps in and shouts, stop, fighting at school is forbidden. He feels that, above all, it is important to follow the rules, otherwise chaos breaks out. He feels it is his duty to uphold the rules that sustain a functioning society. He asks himself, how can I maintain law and order? At stage five, we understand rules as a social contract, as opposed to a strict order. Jessie, who watches from afar, is not sure how she feels about this. To her, rules make sense only if they serve the right purpose. Obviously, the school rules prohibit fighting, but maybe Tom deserves to finally learn his lesson. Just yesterday, he punched a young girl from grade one. She asks herself, does a rule truly serve all members of the community? At stage six, we are guided by universal ethical principles. All those involved now have to face the headmaster. He first explains the school rules and why they exist. He then clarifies that rules are valid only if they are grounded in justice. The commitment to justice carries with it an obligation to disobey unjust rules. The headmaster's highest moral principle is compassion. He believes that all people should learn to understand each other's viewpoints and that they don't feel alone with their feelings. He asks, what are the abstract ethical principles that serve my understandings of justice? At the pre-conventional level, Finn is driven by fear and Mary by self-interest. Both judge what is right or wrong by the direct consequences they expect for themselves and not by social norms. This form of reasoning is common among children. At the conventional level, Betty responds to peer pressure and the teacher follows the rules. Their morality is centered around what society regards as right. At this level, the fairness of rules is seldom questioned. It is common to think like this during adolescence and adulthood. At the post-conventional level,
Jesse knows that things are complicated because individuals may disobey rules inconsistent with their own morality. The headmaster follows a universal ethical idea, at complete disconnect with what society thinks or the rules say. To him, everything is solved through compassion. The right behavior, in his opinion, is therefore never a means to an end, but always an end in itself. Not every person reaches this level. The American psychologist Lawrence Kohlberg based his work on Piaget's theory of cognitive development. In order to confirm his theory of stages of moral development, Kohlberg interviewed boys between the ages of 10 and 16. He analyzed how they would justify their decision when confronted with different hypothetical moral dilemmas. We will now present to you the most famous moral dilemma Kohlberg presented to his students. Let's see what you would do. The Heinz Dilemma A woman was on her deathbed. There was only one drug that the doctors thought might save her. The druggist that made that particular medicine sold it for 10 times the price of the production costs. The sick woman's husband, Heinz, was poor and could not afford to buy the drug, not even with the financial help of his friends. Heinz then asked the pharmacist to sell it to him for half the price, but he refused. To save the life of his wife, Heinz broke into the man's laboratory and stole the medicine. Now tell us. Should Heinz have stolen the drug? Would it change anything if Heinz didn't love his wife? What if the person dying was not his wife, but a stranger? Should the police arrest the druggist for murder if the wife had died? Please write your answers and their justifications in the comments below. Hi, my name's Brian Collin with Learn My Test. If you need to do well on your exams, take practice tests. If you need to make practice tests, go to learnmytest.com. Learn My Test will help you make your own practice tests to study for your exams. Now, today's topic is Lawrence Kohlberg's theory of moral development. Kohlberg's research focused on giving people hypothetical moral dilemmas. So I'm going to start by giving you one of Kohlberg's most famous hypothetical moral dilemmas, Heinz and the drug. So here's Heinz and his wife, Clara. Clara gets very sick and goes to see the doctor. The doctor tells her that she has a life-threatening illness and has only a month to live unless she gets a special medication that is only available at certain pharmacies. Heinz and Clara went to the pharmacy to get Clara's prescription, but unfortunately they found out the prescription cost $10,000, and they do not have $10,000, nor do they have good health insurance. So they had to leave the pharmacy without Clara's prescription. Clara and Heinz went to 10 banks, and none of them would give them a loan for $10,000 to buy Clara's medication. Now Heinz has thought of stealing the drug from the pharmacy. If you were Heinz, would you steal the drug to save your wife? So I want you to write down, if you were Heinz, would you steal the drug, yes or no? And then the second question is, why or why not? Kohlberg would give hypothetical moral dilemmas like Heinz and the drug to the same person when they're a child, an adolescent, a young adult, and an older adult hoping to find a pattern in their responding as they aged. This is called longitudinal research. As people age, Kohlberg found a pattern in how people justified why or why they wouldn't steal the drug. Kohlberg was able to demonstrate this pattern with other hypothetical moral dilemmas. This would lay the groundwork for his theory of moral development.
Kohlberg's theory consists of three levels and six stages. The first level is the pre-conventional level. Stage one is the avoid punishment stage. This means the person will justify their response by avoiding punishment. Like, I don't want to steal the drug because I don't want to go to jail. Stage two in the last stage of the pre-conventional level is considered the what's in it for me stage. So, for example, someone in stage two would say, I would steal the drug because if I steal the drug and my wife lives, I will be considered a hero. What's in it for me? I'll be a hero, so I should steal the drug. Level two is the conventional stage. Stage three is the first stage of the conventional stage and focuses on rules and norms. Someone in stage three would say, I wouldn't steal the drug because a good boy or girl doesn't steal, or I would steal the drug because a good husband would steal to save his wife's life. Stage four is a response that includes following the rules and maintaining societal norms. For example, someone in stage four would say, I wouldn't steal the drug because it's against the law. Or I would steal the drug because most honest people would steal to save their wife's life. Carol Gilligan, one of Kohlberg's students, believed that Kohlberg's theory was biased against females. For example, she believed that females were more likely to prefer stage three, a care relationship orientation of morality, whereas males were more likely to prefer stage four, which is a justice orientation of morality. According to Gilligan, stage three should be equal to stage four. However, Kohlberg disagreed. Level three is the post-conventional level. Many people do not reach the post-conventional level. Stage five is defined by social contracts. So for example, someone in stage five would say, I would not steal because respect of personal property ownership is an important part of maintaining laws and societal order. Someone in stage five may also say, I would steal the drug because a law cannot justify losing a human life. Stage six is the ethical principle association. For example, someone in stage six would say, Saving the most amount of lives possible is always the best decision, so I would steal the drug. Now, very little people fall into stage six, but Kohlberg swore that it existed. Now that you know the stages of Kohlberg's theory, go back and look at your response. What stage level response did you get? Now, if you're just starting college and you answered a level three or a level four, that's okay. Most people who've advanced into the post-conventional stages do so during college. If you want to actually take a real standardized test on moral development, you can take Kohlberg's interview, but the more widely accepted test of moral judgment development is the defining issues test, which was constructed by one of Kohlberg's students, Jim Rest. Kohlberg went to prison and tested convicted criminals. He found that they scored lower on moral development tests than the rest of the population. Later research with the defining issues test would confirm that women score higher than men on moral judgment development tests. Now this would actually refute some of Carol Gilligan's criticisms of Kohlberg's theory that it was biased towards men. DIT research also confirmed that liberal political and religious views were associated with higher moral judgment development scores. The number one predictor of moral judgment development is education level. So the higher your education level is, the higher your moral judgment development scores are likely to be. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you're having trouble studying, The best way to study is to take practice tests. And if you can't find good practice tests, you should make them and learn while you do it using Learn My Test. Check it out for free at www.learnmytest.com. Thank you so much for watching this video. Hi, my name's Brian.
Okay, so that's all. And thanks for watching. So please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube page for more videos on Philo 2 subject. Uh, Philo 101 subject, which is ethics or moral philosophy.